Okay, I know this is uh, the last talk of the you're all a little bit tired, so I've got to be animated in order to keep you awake. And uh, I think one of the first things we need to do in order to get the blood circulating a little bit is to thank uh, George and Carol for this fantastic uh, symposium once again. Uh, great venue. I'm here, so it must be a great venue. Uh, but seriously, this is uh, wonderful and great talks. And please, a round of applause for this. Um, when you give a professional talk, you go to professional meetings, the, the bring out the keynote speakers last. So I'm going to look upon me being the last speaker as the keynote speaker. And really there's been an advantage to that because uh, so many of these presentations have, I can fit into what I'm going to talk about today. John Oller, for instance, uh, began his talk with talking about the myth. Uh, our friend is married, and uh, how he believes that the more work he does, the more he thinks some of those myths might have a little bit of grain of salt in them. And, uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about it with uh, Boy Pond. Um, uh, Larry Babbitt's talked about rifles and guns and bullets and that sort of thing. You're going to see a lot more of that here. And I don't have to explain what a rifle and gun is, which will uh, shorten the presentation. Uh, finally, uh, Karen mentioned that uh, uh, the old wound by uh, Marion and his ankle. Well, I got a bum knee, so I'm going to try to limp around here tonight uh, after playing. A, I'm just, I mean, at my age, I'm just old, too old to be playing soccer, but I uh, did it anyway. So if you're here in the middle of this, uh, my talk of blood curling screen, and, it's just because I believe on my knee improperly. Uh, and please ignore that. Okay, um, one of our most esteemed colleagues who could not be here, but she is here in, in spirit. And we were talking one time about someone who won't be mentioned, but, and she made this observation about him, and that was that he's, the trouble is he knows so much that isn't true. And I feel that's really a wonderful way of getting into my presentation because one of the worst things an archaeologist can do is to uh, investigate a site over a number of years. The best thing an archaeologist can do is go to the site, excavate one year, write a report, and go somewhere else. Because the more you dig, the more you learn, and the more you learn that you were wrong about your interpretations. So one of the things we're going to look at today is back about, oh, I don't know, several, present, several symposiums ago, I gave this presentation. Um, and we first began there in 2004. So things have changed. We've learned some new things. And what we're going to do today is I'm going to bring you up to date um, on um, what we've learned about um, Fort Mott from the continuing excavations we're doing and about how some of those interpretations have changed through the years. So if you've heard this before, um, maybe you have, because some of the things I said then probably were wrong, uh, but they're, they're certainly being changed or maybe more information is being added. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the history of Fort Mott. This is a highly educated audience. You all know where Fort Mott is, and I bet a lot of you can tell the story on your own. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the history of Fort Mott, which will shorten the presentation. I once gave this to Charleston. I was an hour into it, into the history. It just began in archaeology, and I noticed people were leaving, and it turned out the fact that I had been speaking for an hour and I hadn't gotten to the archaeology yet. So I'm going to spare you that. Um, but uh, the history that I am going to tell you, and we will spend some time on, uh, is going to be related to somehow the archaeological interpretations. In other words, it's going to uh, be integrated into that. And the history and the archaeology are going to fit together so that you do need to, to rehear some stories you might have heard before uh, in order to understand what the archaeology is telling us. OK, so here's a, a sort of a our latest look at uh, Fort Mott, and you, you know, just real quickly, 
Fort Lott was one of the outposts, chain of outposts, that uh, were places where the British could rest, refit, supply, as they dragged their supplies from Charleston to the backcountry, places like 96, Camden, Georgetown, Augusta. They needed to get their supplies up there, and they needed places where they could do that. Fort uh, uh, Nelson's Ferry, uh, the fort there, Fort Mott, uh, Granby. Uh, these places were all at Fort Watson. These places were placed, were usually near ferries to protect those ferry crossings because they were strategic points. Okay, so here looking at Fort Mott, uh, which was right next to Belleville plant, uh, Plantation, which was Thompson's Plantation, which was fortified first in the uh, summer of 1780. Um, and uh, later Fort Mott was fortified in, in um, uh, around January, February of uh, 1781. And it was there supposedly to protect Recorded's Ferry, although Walden wrote, wrote a letter afterwards saying he, someone had asked him a question about why did he fortify those places and, and that wasn't going to protect Recorded's Ferry. He wrote back and said, yeah, you're right, I don't know why they were there. Okay, a little closer, uh, bringing into the, uh, the old map, looking at Thompson's and uh, Lloyd Place, because uh, as Nick Watkins has, has noticed, uh, Lloyd Place was probably the outbuilding that was on the Mott property, or the Bruton property, um, prior to the construction of Mrs. Mott's new plantation house. Uh, so, and we have been able to find that, and demonstrate that yes indeed that there was an old farmstead there long before Mrs. Mott's plantation. Uh, you all know about Mrs. Mott. I'm not going to go into a lot of details about her. Great stories about her. But as a little side thing, anybody know what a Mott is? Yes. Oh, what is it? Forts in the Great Castle Peaks. That's right. Fort Mott, and Mott is a probably began as prehistoric fortifications. They would simply go to high places uh, um, and pile up rocks, and then they pile up more rocks, and they pile up more rocks. And of course, those places stayed around for a long time, and eventually people would build castles on top of those things. So I just learned this. I, I was in a conference last. Um, month in Dublin, Ireland, and we went to various battlefields in Ireland, and someone said, and there's a lot, and I said, wow, a lot, so then I'm looking, and there I am standing up there um, on a lot, and I thought that's kind of an interesting thing, and I thought I'd throw that in my slide presentation. Uh, shortly after that picture, I stepped back into a uh, cow patty, um, and I still haven't gotten it completely, my shoes completely clean. I don't know how a cow got up there, but they do. Uh, okay, so February. I just I want to tell you a little story here, a little side historical story that will kind of fit into the um, the archaeology when we get into it. We're going to spend most of our time on archaeology. Uh, many of you might know that uh, Tom uh, Sumter, uh, who gets his, always gets a bad name in these symposiums. I'm waiting for Tom Powers to write that book and defend uh, Sumter, but. Uh, he always gets a bad rap here, and I'm not going to help him any here. Um, he, of course, attacked Belleville in February, crossed an open field, got, had lots of casualties, and he retreated to Maginot's Ferry, which is just downstream from Belleville. Then he heard about a, a, um, a wagon train full of supplies being escorted by the 84th foot, who were at Fort Mott, coming up the road, and he thought, wow, I can take those guys. And he did. He uh, captured the wagons, uh, beat back the British, and took all those supplies that were in those wagons, took them to the ferry, put them on a barge, and started them downriver with the idea that he would cross there, and then he would be able to attack Fort Watson. And if you don't know the story, the person who he hired as the barge operator turned out to be a loyalist. So when the uh, supplies arrived near Fort Watson, where he was supposed to pick them up, the ferry or the barge operator simply shipped them over to back to the British. 
So when Lee and, and Mary attacked and surrounded and sieged Fort Watson in April of 1781, out in front of that uh, Indian mound, the fort, were all of those British <coughs> supplies, which had been captured by the Americans for a short period of time, and then they were back with the British. And then, of course, Marion and Lee would capture uh, Fort Watson and recapture, again, those supplies. And those supplies would be going with Marion and Lee up to Fort Mott and were part of the siege of Fort Mott. <clears throat> well, you know about the siege of Fort Mott. Uh, this began in May 6, 7, uh, 1781 and lasted until May 12, 1781. This engineering drawing of the fort shows a very strong fort which wasn't going to be taken easily. You've got a uh, got a ditch, you've got a palisade in which the dirt, let's see if I can, all right, so you've got a, a dirt ditch, you dig that out, you throw this against the palisade to form the glacis, you've got looking down the bird's eye view, you've got bastions on either corner, you've got the house, ditch, palisade, steps, abatis around it, which are leaves, right, uh, branches, I hate this thing, it's now um, And uh, placed around the uh, fort as torn down trees, which the branches were facing outward. So in order to take that fort, you're gonna have to be able to get close enough through those, through the abatis, over the ditch, up over the places, <coughs> and into the fort, which is gonna be quite a tough little exercise. formalized, uh, maybe they were not that formalized, they were trees, 
But then we have this superhighway, World War I style trench going through, and that just couldn't be, it just could not happen. Uh, but it does show Mrs. Mott, which we will talk about shortly, and the big decision she had to make about having her house be burned down. Okay, next one. Okay, let's talk about that, that uh, very thing. This, this is where we get into the myth part. Uh, as you, many of you know, there are, the story is that uh, probably around the 10th or the 11th, um, well, Lord Rowan left Camden, uh, abandoned Camden on May 10th. The British and the Americans both figured this out uh, very quickly. And so the British inside the fort were going, great, we can hold out a little bit longer, we'll be rescued by Rowan. Meanwhile, the Americans under Marion Lee are going, we gotta do something, we gotta do something quick. And this is where the fun part comes in. There's three versions of what they were decided to do. The traditional story is that uh, they decided they were gonna capture, uh, put, catch the house on fire, and when the British tried to put the house on, uh, the fire out, the, um, the Americans would be able to fire their cannon, keep the British off the roof, and therefore the house would burn out unless they sur surrendered, and they'd all die in fire. Okay, that's the traditional story, and Mrs. Mott saw the bows, the arrows that were being made by the Continental soldiers, and said, hmm, those don't work very well, but I happen to have a African bow it was given to my brother Miles by an Indian trader, and I happened to have brought this up from Charleston, and you can use it, and it's a really fine bow instead of bows and arrows. And that's what they did. They used her bows and arrows, and she volunteered to have her house burned down. Uh, I always thought that's a pretty hokey story. First of all, the bow and arrow set had to get from Charleston to all the way up to Fort Mott. Um, Back that up a little bit. Um, secondly, um, Mrs. Mott lived in the house when the British were there. But when the siege began, she was kicked out of the house. Sorry, ma'am, things are going to happen. You need to leave. She went over to the overseer's house. And she had her da daughters there with a sick child and everything else. And it's just hard for me to imagine that she was trying to escape, get out of the house, and she was trying to go, okay, we need some food, we need, we need our fine wines, uh, we need some diapers, and oh yeah, let's grab the bow and arrow. That never made sense to me. Uh, but that's the story. Okay, now there are two other versions. Version number two, William James says that the fire arrows did not work. Instead, uh, after they tried it, it didn't work, uh, we had uh, Nathan Savage sling a rosin ball up on top of the roof, and that's how the roof got caught on fire. Uh, by sling, I assume that that means he used a sling to get the fire started up on the roof. Version three is the most fun one, which is that they sh shot arrows on top of the roof, but they used uh, a musket. So they had, they had a fire arrow put shot out of a musket. Okay, we're going to talk a little more about that when we get into the archaeology. Advance. George? Okay, oh, here we are. All right, so casualties. Um, not many. Uh, Alan McDonald, Lieutenant Cougar, and some guys were hung afterwards. Uh, there was one supposed casualty of the 84th Infantry of Foot. This does not show up in any of the historic records. Uh, during the siege, it shows up in the, uh, some fragmentary records of the 84th Infantry, but it's not clear whether or not this gentleman died during the battle or simply died of sickness sometime during the occupation. Now, the person we're interested in is Alan McDonald, who was formerly Sergeant uh, Alan McDonald, the famous sharpshooter uh, of Marion's Corps, uh, who was recently promoted. He was one of our casualties. Again, I'll put it into our archaeology a little bit later. The next. All right, great, we're there. I got through the history and you're still awake. I can still see some eyes open there. All right, now we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about the archaeology we've been doing there. 
the last dose since about 2004, so that's almost 12 years. When we first started excavating at Fort Mott, we knew nothing about Fort Mott other than that there was some history told, which we look at, of course, but there was also no indication of what sort of um, archaeology might be there. Uh, and all that was there was the monument that the PAR had put in by 18, uh, 1909. Uh, but we had our drawings and we started using this kind of thing to try to figure out what to do. Uh, and the things we wanted to do was to, as John Allison wants to do, we want to figure out where things happened on the battlefield and how they happened. And we do that by looking at the, the material culture that we find, bullets and all that sort of thing. Um, in order to identify various features. So we really want to find that house in the fort. We want to find that siege trench or set up. The overseer's house. Lee supposedly camped near the overseer's house. We wanted to find that. Where did Marion camp? That was a big question. Uh, where did the British regulars camp? They must have been around the house, right? Well, I don't know. And of course, we wanted to find all those other kinds of things, like the uh, uh, oh, just whatever might be there. The well. Where's the well? Well, we have we, have, we did find the well just recently. Uh, it, we didn't find it the, the October first October flood, not this one, but uh, the October flood of last year found the uh, the well for us. We were up there shortly afterwards, and there's a big hole in the ground where that old well was. Okay, next one. Uh, the methods we use. We use metal detecting as one of our primary tools, but we use there all the formalized kinds of excavations that archaeologists dig square holes. And we also use mechanical means. The mechanical means were a latch dish effort, so to speak, to find the ditch. Um, but we now feel very badly that we use that. Sometimes you do these things in the moment and you regret them for the rest of your life. Next slide. Uh, the first year we were there, we did some formalized excavations. First, to find the sap, which we thought the shortest, closest places to be would be right off the edge of the, of the hillside there, and we're putting trenches there. Well, my colleague Jim Lake uh, and I uncovered the ditch of the house and the fort, uh, and began putting a trench across that to see if we could intersect that. Next. There's my colleague in there, digging away and doing the drawing after finishing. The soils are so hard at that side that you cannot dig by color. Often when you disturb the soil and you put mixed soils, topsoils and stuff like that back in the ground, it becomes an archaeological feature and you can see the differences between the undisturbed soils and the um, and the soils have been disturbed. If that area there has been disturbed. That's your, what we call archaeological feature. In this case, we had to do it completely by touch. We had to feel the soils and the differences between the what was disturbed soil and what was natural soil, because the colors in the soil simply would not come up out. Go ahead. All right. Uh, up in the right-hand corner is a faded drawing of the profile of what we were seeing when we dug the ditch. And you can see it's different than the engineer's drawing. And that was our first indication that this drawing may not be so engineer-like. You know, we, look, we want to trust some people. We want to trust, um, we, we can't trust historians because you know what they're going to say. We can't trust archaeologists because they're just looking through their own eyes and making interpretations. But you can trust an engineer. I mean, they're scientists, right? So this is an engineering drawing, and then, oh, geez, it's not really an upside-down trapezoid. It's a triangle, and it's got a little dip there where, where some nasty stuff probably was from the British soldiers when they relieved themselves. But it's not like the drawing, and that sort of was our first hint that that drawing was not so accurate. Next. Uh, we found the house. Um, the chimneys for the house, uh, it probably is not necessarily Mrs. Mott's house. It could be Mr. Love's house from the early uh, 19th century. But we have two uh, chimney bases 
They're just right at the surface, so they're in pretty bad shape. Uh, the plows hit them off and, and tore most of them up. But we have we have the shape of the house and the, the two can chimneys. Okay. Metal detecting is our primary means of investigating because we want to find the artifacts and we want to find we want to know where the locations of each of those artifacts are because the patterns that they provide us as to location are going to give us information about the siege. Go ahead. These are the areas looking down on a topographic map of what we have covered systematically. Everything in gray is we have hit um, at what we call 100%. In other words, we've hit it uh, in close transit intervals, crisscrossing up and down in the lanes with metal detectors, and then going perpendicular to that, up and down using metal detectors uh, on many occasions. And here's what we found in terms of the areas. Each one of those areas represents a locus of artifacts or some area which was systematically covered, which we can count on having done a pretty darn good job of finding the metal artifacts there. Uh, go ahead. We'll talk about each one of these things. Now, we, from Larry and from John, we've gotten a lot of information about the, the great stuff that, that uh, you can learn from lead shot. Lead shot is, uh, well, it holds its shape, but it can be quick as malleable. It can, it can change. And whatever you do to that, if you don't do anything, it's nice and round. And so you know that if you find it in the ground, you've got a pretty good idea that it was dropped rather than something fired. If it's been deformed, uh, you can tell it's been fired. And the deformities of that ball will give you also indications as to whether or not it's a rifle or came from a, remember, a rifle, a rifle, or a gun, smooth board. Uh, it can tell you something about um, what it might have hit. Um, and it can also, uh, we're learning um, recently that you can do some experiments with uh, lead shot of the 18th century and get some idea of how long it was in flight. In other words, whether it was a high impact or a low impact. And it can tell you something more about the distance between lines, for instance. Okay, next. So how do we use that here? Uh, first of all, let's look at uh, rifle shot. This distribution, every one of these little dots represents a rifle ball or a gun ball uh, from a small caliber rifle or gun um, and uh, around the fort. Uh, and you can see some clustering. You can see an area there to the southwest. A nice cluster there of, the, of rifle shot probably hitting the house or the palisade and bouncing out, or even as hard as the uh, glaciers have become in the sun that we know from the soils, probably hit the glaciers and bounced out. It's a nice cluster, and it's nice to see, okay, there's a bunch of rifle shot around the fort. That means Marion's a rifleman, whether they were shooting smooth bore or rifle rifles, uh, were shooting at the fort just like they were supposed to. Um, and that's nice. Now, here's something interesting. Go ahead. Next. Okay, this is the, we're not, we're looking at rifle shot now. That same rifle shot that was uh, shown in the uh, first slide. Uh, at the bottom, you're looking at the weight distribution of rifle shot at Fort Watson, the, the uh, American fire into Fort Watson. Um, and as Larry explained, these things are not manufactured, they're crafted. So the rifles, no matter what they were, even though they, the common size was a 54 caliber and about a 15 gram lead, piece of lead, um, we're quite a wide variety of it, right? So for Watson, you see a nice distribution here at the bottom of various size rifle shot. And I can tell you from looking at Marion sites and other militia type sites, both camps and battlefields, that's what you usually get. Now look up at Fort Mott. It's the same stuff, same guys. This is only a month later. 
is the same guys that were firing from the tower are now shooting at the fort. But look at the distribution by weight. You've got a huge number of 15 gram shot. And that's gotta tell you something. Something cultural there is probably going on. And what we think is that guys that are doing most of the shooting, there's only a couple of people out there doing the shooting. In other words, they're, they're using their, they're, they're trying to hit something behind a fort. And so they're making their, their, their best guys are taking their shots. Now, okay, I want to tell you some just so stories, just because I, I think they're fun to be and interesting. Who was one of the guys that was killed at Fort Mott? Alan McDonald, the sharpshooter. Was Alan McDonald one of the guys who stuck his head up just one too many times? but he was doing most of the shooting. It's a nice story to tell, uh, but it does seem that something's going on there. Marion was relying on one or two guys doing most of the shooting to keep the British heads down. All right, thanks. Now, another thing we uh, saw with, with the British cluster uh, fire going out from the fort, and remember, we had not been able to find the sap but once we plotted the distribution of fired rifle, or excuse me, fired lead balls going downrange, you see a nice cluster to the north, northeast, along a nice line. And you see the, the shot in the, with the circles, with the open areas in the center, those are drop balls. So drop balls near the fort, fired shot going away from the fort. Great, that's, that's the kind of thing you like to see. Isn't that neat? That's a nice distribution. So, that's what first told us, what are they firing at? Anybody? The thing about archaeology is it's not rocket science. Almost any of us can do it. Yeah, who said that? I heard a voice mumbling. They're shooting at something. What are they shooting at? The people building a set. That's pretty cool. Okay, so now we know where the sap might be. Here's something else that's interesting. Uh, almost all of those, those large, big old pieces of lead from the brown vessels, the 75 caliber, had these strong bands around them, these bands. So they were impacted by the ground, but they also had a band around them. Uh, we thought that the reason that was was because they were trying to put a large ball in a smaller barrel in order to get accurate shot. That can be done. But it also can be done by overcharging the weapon. In other words, maybe doing a double charge in the weapon and firing it on the brown vest. In either case, you're going to get that banding. But you're also going to get what they wanted, which was a much more accurate shot. Why? Because they weren't have, they weren't trying to hit a mass of guys about 80 yards away. They were trying to get someone doing something. And what that something was was the sap that they were trying to hit those guys who were digging the sap. Okay, so we think we know where it is. Next slide. Uh, and we move on. That's where we think the sap might be. Next. And there's a, a, a picture showing Fort Mott looking up towards from the sap, where, where we think the sap is going to be towards the monument where we know the fort is. So, next. Because we're archaeologists, we like to move slowly and deliberately, we dig square holes. And so we dig these square trenches uh, across the site looking for the top of that sap. And that was very puzzling because we couldn't see it. Uh, we couldn't see anything. And yet, what else is the explanation for that lead? distribution of lead shot. British balls all in the same area. It's, it's got to be there somewhere. Okay, next. That's where we got a little aggressive. We decided to bring uh, the landowner, Luther Wanamaker's track hoe out there to do some exploration, shall we say. Next. And that's when that turned out to be, at the time, the right thing to do because everywhere we dug a trench across that area, we ran into the sap, not looking down from the thing, but looking in the profile. 
where the soils at least had some moisture and where you could see the profile of the sap. So each one of those little things there is part of the sap that was dug by the, the Americans during the siege. The neat thing about it is when we plotted this out, we could see they were here, 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 and here, indicating that it was zigging and zagging like a good proper 18th century sap should be done. So we were kind of interested in that. So we began to do some clearing of that sap. And during 2013, 2014, we spent a lot of time trying to dig out the sap. Um, and uh, it was hard work. <laughs> uh, again, we couldn't tell the difference between the subsoils and the soils except by the feel of the trowel and the sound of the trowel against the soils, because you could tell the difference when you got to the edge. Next. Um, and there's the sap. That's the actual, the actual sap. I mean, it's, a lot of people look at that and say, well, you guys didn't dig straight holes. This is it. Uh, and the neat thing about that is, to me, is these guys are slaves, some continental soldiers, maybe some American men, digging against British soldiers, shooting at them, and they're taking care to make a pretty nice little rounded at the bottom of that sap. See, and there it is in the profile, kind of a, a, a light-shaped U at the bottom. That's the actual sap. We stop when we hit the subsoils, undisturbed soils. So that's how they dug it. And that's what it looked like. It was probably light enough for one or two guys um, to be able to pass by each other, but uh, not, not the super highway that we're constantly envisioned. Okay, so back in 2004, we had brought out some remote sensing when we first started this project because obviously the best way to find the fort was to do some remote sensing that would tell us what was going on underneath the soils without having to dig it. And that failed miserably. We saw nothing. And so, this is how archaeologists are just as stubborn as everybody else, we never quite thought that, you know, People would say, why don't you do some remote sensing? Well, it just didn't work. So the soils aren't popular out there for that sort of thing. In 2014, 2015, uh, my colleague John Leader, the state archaeologist, got himself a new piece of, of equipment. This was a gradiometer, which is a magnetometer three times. Three magnetometers working together to investigate the soils. And what we're looking at is the magnet magnetics in the ground. Um, over millions of